Next up, uh, we'll hear from Dr. Heinrich Stacker, who will tell us how we're going to get all of these great new compounds into the inner ear. Thank you, Larry. Uh, and thank you uh, to Oris for putting uh, the symposium together. I think it was very successful when we did this last year, and uh, hopefully, hopefully it will be again. So um, this is obviously a, a, an interesting topic, judging from everybody here. And when you look at the otology textbooks, it's fascinating. We have big, fat textbooks about cholesteatomas and uh, really the treatment of what are the most common disorders, sensory neural hearing loss, tinnitus, uh, dizziness, uh, make up very, very small sections because really nothing has been uh, developed to date. Now the inner ear is obviously very small uh, compared uh, to the rest of the body. The uh, human uh, cochlear uh, and vestibular fluid space is about 150 microliters. It's uh, physiologically similar to the CNS and uh, kidney uh, and we have one a real advantage. It's a relatively closed system. There is in many, many people a patent uh, cochlear aqueduct, so it's possible to lose drug into the CSF space, um, but uh, we have the possibility of delivering um, to, the, uh, to the inner ear locally. Uh, the inner ear is inside uh, a vascular tight junction system similar to the blood-brain barrier, which means that Certain of the larger systemically uh, delivered drugs, uh, antibodies, for example, need to be transported uh, out or diffused from the circulation into the cochlea, which is often a very inefficient uh, process. So to get therapeutic uh, levels in the cochlea with systemic delivery, we have to give huge, huge uh, doses of drug, which uh, for the agents that are also active in the central nervous system can often have undesirable uh, side effects. So a couple of uh, early studies uh, in years ago looked at the differences uh, in uh, intravenous versus intratympanic uh, delivery uh, of uh, a prednisone and an NMDA uh, inhibitor and came up with rather, uh, rather similar outcomes over you know, 430 to 480 fold higher concentration of the drug uh, within, uh, within the inner ear when delivered uh, uh, locally uh, versus versus uh, systemically, and since then uh, we've uh, you know we've been learning a lot a uh, lot more about this. So uh, this this particular slide is for Larry, who's missing the uh, the, the history of uh, EMT meeting tonight to be here. So so people have thought about local delivery since uh, since the early 19th century. So there was a um, a delivery system to put ethyl acetate up the eustachian tube for the treatment of tinnitus. In the late 40s, morphine was applied um, uh, through the tympanic membrane, also for the treatment of tinnitus. And we've had a variety uh, of different devices, uh, such as the Silverstein uh, wick uh, and the Arenberg run window catheter to try to supply uh, drugs uh, to the cochlea more, uh, more efficiently. So uh, how, how, what are our options uh, besides these older therapies for um, accessing the middle ear. Meringotomy uh, is obviously the, the easy one. Um, so uh, nowadays I put a little bit of emla cream uh, on, uh, on a patient and do the meringotomy under local. I don't use the phenol uh, anymore. Very, very easy to do. Short, easy, and safe. For longer treatments, and this was brought up uh, in, in the, the questions this morning, once we really define how long we want to treat a patient for, we probably will have to have some sort of uh, some sort of delivery device, but I think that's going to be uh, disease and medication um, medication specific. Uh, there's a lot of research going on uh, on drug delivery uh, across an intact uh, uh, tympanic membrane. So there's ways of permeabilizing uh, uh, drugs to get them into the into the middle ear by just using an eardrop, but you still have a, a very very steep fall off. Uh, in uh, efficiency, and some of the stuff Adrian talked about these uh, th these uh, drugs that are conjugated to this path sequence uh, that can easily cross um, uh, cross membranes. So this is just some uh, some some animal data looking uh, looking at uh, otic versus systemic uh, delivery uh, with uh, with permeability enhancers. 
that shows that in theory this works, but still the, the air barrier inside the middle ear overall is still, um, uh, you know, still prevents, uh, prevents delivery. So we've largely uh, stuck uh, to directly putting stuff in uh, the middle ear. We really only need tiny amounts of drug, a half cc. So even if you have a fairly toxic drug um, and, and you, um, you swallow the residual uh, down through the eustachian tube, you do not get a big systemic uh, side effect. Important to remember, when we're treating the patient like this, eventually the patient does that and stands up. And the natural position of the round window membrane uh, is that. And so gravity will pull uh, drug away from the round window and uh, you'll lose effect. So there's been a lot of interest in uh, reformulating drugs. Uh, the uh, AM uh, products are in hyaluronic acid. The autonomy drug is in a, in a paloxamer, and there's lots of research on uh, various film-forming agents so that you can get the drug to stick to the round window for longer, uh, for longer time periods. So we always thought that really the round, win round window uh, is key. You can um, uh, make a myrigotomy in, in most cases, see it directly. You can have small uh, endoscopes now. I forward my partners salivary endoscope and in the clinic can actually put it through a myringotomy and uh, inspect the round window membrane. That's, uh, that's doable in a cooperative patient. And we've known for years that bacterial toxins and all kinds of different substances can, uh, can get uh, across. So factors that affect uh, drug delivery. Uh, first of all, the molecular weight of the drug, um, the concentration, how soluble it is in lipid, and the electrical charge of the compound and the thickness of the membrane, so which, which is variable. So for example, a lot of the chinchilla studies, chinchillas have a very, very thin uh, round window membrane and probably the delivery kinetics when, uh, when moving and translating a drug into human use is not, uh, is not comparable. You can enhance uh, the permeability of a drug by making it hypertonic. Uh, histamine, leukotrienes, prostaglandins in, uh, affect permeability. So the run window is more permeable in an infected state. And most recently, some really interesting research coming out of Columbia where they're using a device to make micro perforations in the round window to enhance drug uh, delivery. For, for many years, there was um, a concern that the pseudo membrane over the round window would affect um, drug <coughs> delivery. That's really uh, not turned out, uh, turned out to be the case. So a, a limited list of, uh, of substances that are known uh, to directly cross the round window membrane. There's been studies done uh, on all of these, and I'm happy to share those, uh, those references. So some good, some just for labeling and tracing studies, but you can get salicylate laden, ketamine, lidocaine, obviously for anybody who's ever accidentally uh, uh, in injected an ear and filled it with lidocaine. That makes people very dizzy. Uh, chloramphenicol, neomycin, obviously gentamicin, uh, and uh, the bacterial endotoxins. So it's a, it's a long list. What has come out, we were so focused on the round window for many years, um, is um, probably the, the greater entry uh, point into the inner ear for drugs that are uh, filled into the, uh, into the middle ear is the stapes foot plate. This is uh, data out of Alex Salt's uh, lab at Wash U, uh, again from a guinea pig model where they uh, systematically sealed uh, the round window and found that uh, administration uh, of, uh, of gentamicin into the ear probably crosses more through uh, the stapedio-vestibular ligament than through the round window. In some of the smaller animal models, there's a, a second uh, issue in mice, for example, uh, the uh, bony uh, capsule of the cochlear is thin enough that you can get drugs diffusing directly uh, through. So when you're looking uh, at, at, at studies out there, uh, it's very, very difficult to assess um, uh, the actual pathway into, into the ear. But you know, based on this data now for my, for my cochlear implant patients, when I'm doing a hearing preservation surgery, I'll actually pack the oval window with, uh, with a little bit of uh, 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 steroid impregnated gel foam to have it sit there and, and hopefully get longer, you know, longer delivery. Another thing to take into account is uh, the human cochlea is big. This shows chinchilla versus human. So if you fill something into the, uh, into the middle ear space, it has to get in through the round window, uh, through, the, through the stapes. 
and to affect uh, the low frequency region of the ear has to diffuse uh, all, uh, all the way uh, up uh, to the top of the cochlea, and that's fairly, fairly far. And uh, Alex Salt has a, has a great uh, uh, web-based tool on his, on his website where you can actually put uh, different uh, substances in a, in a model um, middle ear and look how they, uh, how they diffuse. And the sort of take-home message from, from uh, Alex's studies is that in many cases, uh, when you just give a regular liquid shot of, uh, let's say, dexamethasone, you probably never ever get absorption into the uh, mid to apical, uh, apical turn of the inner ear just because it takes too long uh, to, to diffuse. So um, that's, the, that's where we're at with regular middle ear delivery. I just wanted to use the last couple of minutes uh, to talk um, uh, about uh, something that's sort of hot off the presses in drug delivery uh, in general. Uh, we, uh, because of some of these diffusion issues, and especially once we get into biologics and larger molecules, uh, you want to think about directly uh, injecting drugs into the inner ear. Uh, we currently have uh, an open clinical trial for hair cell regeneration using uh, an adenovector that contains uh, the gene ATO1. Um, uh, this is just a, a temporal bone model showing we, we fenestrate the stapes foot plate, put a microcatheter in, and then with a micropump uh, infuse, uh, infuse uh, the drug. This is the, uh, the entry criteria. The sites at the moment are at the uh, University of Kansas, at Columbia, and at Hopkins. Uh, and so far we have seven patients, uh, seven patients completed. So, and what I can tell you now I, uh, about the data is that uh, up, up to 40 microliters at least we can directly uh, inject into the, into the human inner ear without loss of, uh, of residual hearing. So, which, uh, which, so I, I think slowly we are moving more from local therapy to considering uh, uh, delivering, uh, delivering drugs into the inner ear itself. Now, obviously, that's a one-shot deal when we're thinking about treating somebody for autoimmune inner ear disease, maybe for presbycusis or a number of other disorders. You, you're going to need years of delivery. Uh, the inner ear diseases are often uh, indolent and slowly progressive, long human lifespan. Uh, so uh, people have been thinking uh, about how, how to do delivery over, over long time periods. Um, this doesn't look that, uh, that like that much. It's been shrunk down a lot since this picture, but Draper Labs from uh, in, uh, in cooperation with Mass Ein Ear uh, Infirmary delivered a reciprocating pump uh, that has a lyophilized ribbon of drug on the inside. It pulls in perilymph, mixes the drug, and spits it back out into the cochlea. And probably uh, something like this hooked to uh, a delivery electrode, so a short cochlear implant electrode, which just has ports on it will be what we are uh, will be implanting in the future for long term uh, for long term delivery. Okay, so in conclusion, uh, the round window and, me and uh, membrane and stapes foot plate are portals for toxins and medications. The size and charge of a substance really determine uh, the diffusion. Permeability can be um, uh, modified, and uh, probably as we learn more and more about the inner ear. Uh, we will be doing more and more office delivery. So I think this is really, uh, really going to grow. Um, in the long term, alternate delivery routes, including pumps or injection through the stapes foot plate, I think you know, all of you know how to do a stapes, that, that, that's going to be part of our uh, armamentarium. And currently, uh, drugs are being formulated as gels or films to keep them up against the inner ear structures and uh, improve long term uh, delivery. So thank you very much.